kissed von Moltke rapturously. But the excitement was premature. General Le Mans was not in the Citadel, he was in one of the forts. And under his firm direction, these continued to resist. The way to Brussels was still blocked. In the following days, the short pause while Germany's battering train assembled, the nations discerned the countenance of war. At this stage, many found it pleasing. The German crown prince wrote, The electric spark of the immobilization decree fired a train of indescribable enthusiasm from Memel to the tiniest hamlet in the southern German mountains. At that time, the vast majority of the German people regarded the military solution of the ever-increasing political tension as the end of a nightmare. A French officer was leaving Paris with his regiment for Verdun. Our great nation's heart was beating tumultuously as in days long past. Crowds were gathered at every station, behind every barrier, and at every window along our road. Cries of Vive la France and Vive la May could be heard everywhere, while people waved handkerchiefs and hats. The women were throwing kisses and heaped flowers on our convoy, and the young men were shouting Au revoir and à bientôt. At one grade crossing, a young woman lifted her baby towards us, shouting, He too, like you, will go someday and do his duty. It must have been like this in 1792. The soul of France had again attained the height of her greatest period in history. Saturday, August the 1st, was a quiet day for the officer in charge at London's chief recruiting office, Great Scotland Yard. Precisely eight recruits presented themselves to him. Then came Sunday and August bank holiday. When he returned to his office on August the 4th, the crowd awaiting him was so dense that it took him 20 minutes and the help of 20 policemen to get through to his desk. And from that moment he worked continuously through the day, attesting men. When Lord Kitchener's appeal went out for the first hundred thousand, your king and country need you, the flow increased all over Britain. 100 men an hour, 3,000 a day, 6,000 over the war's first weekend joined the army. So many came now that they had to be turned away. The whole country and the great dominions of the British Empire with it were swept by the emotion which Rupert Brooke precisely put into words. Now God be thanked who has matched us with his hour and caught our youth and wakened us from sleeping with hand made sure, clear eye and sharpened power, to turn as swimmers into cleanness leaping, glad from a world grown old and cold and weary. Neither religion nor socialism nor the most pure pacifism was immune from the surge of this worldwide outburst of passion. Among the cheering London crowds on August the 4th was the philosopher Bertrand Russell. I had fondly imagined that wars were forced upon a reluctant population by despotic and Machiavellian governments. But now I was tortured by patriotism. I desired the defeat of Germany as much as any retired colonel. Love of England is very nearly the strongest emotion I possess, and in appearing to set it aside at such a moment, I was making a very difficult renunciation. The liberal Manchester Guardian, an important platform for pacifist opinion, said in its editorial on August the 5th, England declared war on Germany at 11 o'clock last night. All controversy is therefore at an end. Our front is united. Now there is nothing for Englishmen to do but to stand together and help by every means in their power to the attainment of our common object and early and decisive victory over Germany. It was quickly obvious to thoughtful men that nations in this mood would not easily give up the struggle. Obstinate Liège was already becoming a symbol. General Le Mans was the war's first hero. The phrase, gallant little Belgium, was born. 
adding fuel to the emotionalism of the moment. Behind Liège, the image of a brave king and a resolute people rallying against aggression was firmly planted. The world applauded a small David who did not fear Goliath. Yet it was Goliath who won this fight. The great guns and mortars were brought up against Liège, the Krupp 420s, the Skoda 305s borrowed from Austria. The Belgian forts were pounded into rubble. Steel plates were smashed and buckled. Human flesh was turned to bloody pulp. General Le Mans was buried under the wreckage and dug out to find himself a prisoner. His German captors allowed him to keep his sword. The war was young enough for such gestures and the Germans could afford them, for with the fall of Liège there was nothing to prevent their masses from pouring into Belgium, towards Brussels and down the river Meuse. The Belgian army could not hope to stop them. It would be up to Belgium's allies. They too were on the move. Carefully in step with Germany, the French army mobilized, called in its reservists, issued them with boots and live ammunition, drafted them to divisions, army corps and armies, and massed them behind the frontier. On foot and by train, horses and men moved to their ordained positions. A regulation was turning into a catchphrase. Quarante hommes, huit chevaux. Forty men or eight horses. Neither men nor horses found it comfortable. France also had a plan, Plan 17. It was as simple as von Schlieffen's, but scarcely so promising. Whatever the circumstances, it is the Commander-in-Chief's intention to advance, all forces united, to the attack of the German armies. Whatever the circumstances, the French army would advance. Whatever the circumstances, in full strength. Whatever the circumstances, through the lost provinces of Lorraine and Alsace, towards the Rhine. There were few who doubted, for the army was France's pride, a firm rock amid the shifting sands of Republican government. The French infantry was still dressed in the red trousers and the red capes of 50 years before. Like the Germans, most of them were peasants, strong and hardy, more enduring than anyone supposed, and possessing a quality of Gallic fury which was heightened by their mission to attack. Amid the historic costumes of old France, there was a whiff of Africa. Zouaves and Turcos from Algeria and Morocco, and the famous Foreign Legion. Cavalry contained cuirassiers and dragoons whose dress had scarcely changed since Waterloo and gay chasseurs. All of them were trained and eager to charge with lance and sabre, whatever the circumstances. With uniforms drawn from history and ideas drawn from fiction, the French army was completely up to date in one respect. It had the finest field gun in the world, the 75 millimeter, the Soissant cans, flexible, mobile, able to fire 25 rounds a minute. Above all, plentiful. With these plans and with these armaments, Europe's two leading powers collided. Which would stand the test? While Germany waited for the fall of Liège to open the way for her masses in the north, the French struck in the south into the green mountains of Alsace. And France, in her turn, was able to make a premature jubilee. Frontier posts were torn down. Mülhausen once again became Mulhouse. The Germans counterattacked and were soon in Mülhausen again. The French retreated in such a haste that we actually had to run after them. 